Good afternoon to you all, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. George Xavier Kuhn, and I'll be taking you to another session of the Clock Questions. So, today we'll be starting from question 19. Hopefully, we'll finish along question 23, 24. Just discuss a few questions. Alright, so to not waste your time, I'll start off with the first question. Alright, as you remember from the method I told you initially, now we always start from the last part of the question to understand what the question is trying to ask us. So what drug has such a side effect? So I know that I'm dealing with drugs and I need to be aware of which drugs I'm going to be analyzing. So we have a patient who's suffering from infiltrative pulmonary tuberculosis. So they have pulmonary tuberculosis, which is infiltrative. And they were prescribed streptomycin and fumpicin, isomyazide and pyrazinamide as well as vitamin C. So they were prescribed the following drugs. And then one month after beginning the treatment, the patient started complaining of reduced hearing and tinnitus as well. So they have reduced hearing and tinnitus. All right, so basically, uh, this patient has autotoxicity and then from these drugs the drug that is popularly known for causing octotoxicity is streptomycin uh, <clears throat> so autotoxicity is something that can occur if the auditory nerve or the vestibular system is affected usually can occur due to, to drugs such as streptomycin now it can be partially reversible or irreversible and in terms of causes of autotoxicity there are several drugs that can cause autotoxicity sorry uh, so we know that uh, aminoglycosides are definitely some of the drugs that are you know at the top of the group that can cause autotoxicity so examples of an aminoglycoside would include um, gentamicin um, as well as amethysin. So the other drugs that can also cause um, autotoxicity can be uh, loop diuretics such as furosemide or chemotherapy drugs such as cisplatin or carboplatin. So basically uh, this patient has autotoxicity. So this is basically a simple question. I think it's a simple question. All right, um, moving on to question 20. So the question is what biochemical parameter is the most important in making diagnosis so we need to look for a biochemical biochemical parameter okay so we have a 39 year old man who is complaining of morning headaches appetite loss nausea vomiting and periodic nasal hemorrhages okay so morning headaches Appetite loss, nausea, morning vomiting, as well as uh, periodic nausea hemorrhages. Okay, so the patient had a case of gonorrhoenophritis at age of 15, and now the patient is 39, so age of 15, age of gonorrhoenophritis. And then examination revealed that they have an arterial blood pressure of 220 over 130, which is extremely elevated in my regard. And then there's skin hemorrhages, skin hemorrhages on his arms and legs and pallor of the skin and mucous membranes. All right. Um, so okay, and for you, I have to exit the drawing for me to to scroll up and and uh, inform you of the answer. So in this case, it would be blood crescent that we have to, to be uh, assessing for, looking for. So basically from what I can understand and explain to you guys that there's a high probability that this patient has chronic kidney disease. Why? Because they already indicated to you that they had, the patient had one episode of acute uh, common at the age of 15. So there's a high probability that they might have you know a case of kidney disease in the future in this case unfortunately it's got it's uh, chronic disease and then the patient has pallor 
and the skin and mucous membranes, which is usually a sign of anemia. And if you remember that um, erythropoietin, which is the hormone that is responsible for the synthesis of uh, red blood cells, is uh, synthesized and found in the kidney. And in patients that have kidney disease or chronic kidney disease, they usually have anemia of chronic disease. That's one in anemia due to insufficient production of erythropoietin. Um, and then the patient has skin hemorrhages in their arms and legs, which can be an indicator indicative sign of um, thrombocytopenia, which would probably also be able to explain the periodic NASA hemorrhages. And then uh, in addition to this, the patient also has an arterial blood pressure, which is uh, excessively elevated of 220 over 130, um, which could be also an indication of kidney disease. Now, the reason for choosing creatinine is because it's usually um, uh, one of the waste products that are uh, formed from creatinine, uh, which are excreted by the kidney and will usually increase in cases of any kidney disease. Um, and creatinine is uh, removed from the kidney uh, primarily by glomerular filtration and also by the proximal tubular secretion. Now, little or no tubular reabsorption of creatinine is used. Hence, it's used as a biochemical marker to assist the functioning of the kidney. Now, if the filtration uh, in the kidney is deficient, then blood creatinine levels can rise. Therefore, creatinine concentration in blood and urine can be used to calculate uh, creatinine clearance, which correlates approximately with uh, the glomerular filtration rate. Um, and it's, uh, when you have the creatinine, you can also have, uh, easily assess, uh, or you can use it to try and find out what can, uh, be the estimated glomerular filtration rate. Um, all right. Uh, so yeah, so I'll, I'll move on to the next question. All right. So we have question 21. Now question is as follows. So what is the most likely diagnosis? So we need to diagnose something. A worker of a glass blowing workshop. So occupation is important. Glass blowing workshop. Complaints of a headache, irritability and visual impairment. He sees everything as if it's a net. He sees everything as if it's a net. All right. Uh, the objective examination will use a hyperemic sclera, a thickened cornea, decreased opacity of the pupils, and visual acuity, which is decreased 0 0.8, um, in the left eye and 0 0.7 in the right eye. The worker uses no means of personal protection. So from this, uh, the answer is going to be cataracts. Uh, now the reason for saying that the patient has cataracts is because they have uh, mentioned for you in the question that the patient has or sees everything as if it's to a net, so net like appearance over the eyes. And then there's also a decreased opacity of the pupils which eventually uh, would lead to decrease in visual acuity now risk factors for the patient developing cataracts in this case would be the fact that um, the patient uh, works as a glass blowing as a glass blower and then they use no personal protection of their eyes uh, which would be very very bad in that case um, also, cataracts um, forms a clouding of the lens which leads to decreased vision and usually develops slowly and presents with symptoms of faded colors, blurry visions, halos around the light, trouble with uh, bright lights and trouble seeing at night. So, so basically that's about it. I think this was also a quite simple and straightforward question. Alright, now we move on to question 22. Uh, which says, what method of diagnosis verification would be most efficient? 
most efficient. All right, most efficient among all of these. Okay, so a 42 for a week, a week, or a week, or for the past seven days, 42 year old man has been suffering from fever attacks. So okay, this man has been having some fever attacks, followed by high temperature, which occur age 48 hours. Body temperature rises up to 40 degrees Celsius and then decreases in three to four hours with excess of sweat. So usually sweating would be used as a compensatory mechanism in cases of high body temperature. So the patient presents with loss of appetite, general fatigue, and then the skin is pale and sallow. The liver and the so the liver and the spleen are enlarged, so we have a hepatosplenomegaly and dense on palpation. So based on this, the method of choice for examination is microscopy of blood smear and thick blood foam. This is basically used when you're diagnosing malaria. Um, so for this, I would like to go over the, the cycle or the life cycle of malaria using some information from the CDC. So just go over to everything here. So the natural history of malaria involves psychical infection of human and female anopheles. In humans, the parasite grow and multiply faster in liver cells than in blood cells. And in the blood, successive roots of malaria grow inside the cells and destroy them, releasing daughter cells, which are known as merozytes, that continue the life cycle and invading other cells. So, in general, merozytes are the reason why we have uh, the, the the clinical symptoms that we see in patients. So, the blood stage parasites that are those that cause symptoms of malaria. Okay, so those are the merozytes. Uh, when certain forms of blood stage parasites, so gametocytes, which occur in the female and the male forms, are ingested by the anaphylus mosquito. They mate in the gut of the mosquito and begin a cycle growth and multiplication in the mosquito. After 10 to 18 days, a form of the parasite called the sporozyte migrates to the mosquito's salivary glands. Uh, and then when the anopheles mosquito uh, takes a blood meal with another human being, the anticoagulant saliva is injected together with the sporozytes and um, migrate to them, thereby beginning the cycle. Now, thus, the infected mosquito carries uh, the disease from one human to another as a vector. So you should also understand what is a vector and the difference. So basically, a, vec a vector is um, a microorganism or an organism that is able to, to transmit a pathology without it being infected by the uh, bacteria or, or virus it carries. So for example, the, the anopheles mosquito is a vector because it does not get infected by the mosquito, but, sorry, by the, uh, by the plasmodium. So the mosquito does not get infected by the plasmodium, but humans are the ones that suffer from the disease. Um, all right, so I'll come back to this image a bit later on. Let me just finish off, uh, with the mini part. So the malaria parasite life cycle involves two hosts. So during a blood meal, a malaria infected female anopheles mosquito inoculates sporozoids into the human host, so that's stage one, and then the sporozytes are the ones that are going to infect the liver cells. Um, now will be stage two. Okay, let's see if it's it's going to be uh, or not so clear. Um, where is stage one? All right, so stage one here. So mosquito inoculates sporozytes into the humans. So that's stage one, and then sporozytes would uh, go on to infect the liver cells, which is going to be here, stage two. And then stage three, the mature, um, the, the sporozytes would then mature into schizones, uh, which is here, yeah, stage three, which rupture and are released and release merozoids. So schizones would, would then rupture to release uh, <coughs> the, the merozoids. So, uh, remember that Plasmodium vivax and Plasmodium ovale have a dormant stage or hypohypnozoids 
which can persist in the liver if untreated and can cause relapses by invading the bloodstream weeks or even years after. So remember this because the uh, reason for going through the malaria life cycle or the reason I'm, I'm doing this is because uh, the malaria questions can come in different ways. So firstly, they can just ask you about the diagnosis or they can ask you about which type of plasmodium would cause uh, fever to occur, for example, 48 hours or 72 hours. Uh, or which one would be more chronic uh, compared to the other. So plasmodium v or value would be the ones that would, would cause a more chronic form of the malaria. Moving on. So after this uh, initial replication in the livers, or which is also known as the exoerythrocytic schizogony, which is uh, A, which is just basically replication in the liver, uh, we move on to... Um, Asexual multiplication in the erythrocytes, which is erythrocytic schizogony. Now, the merozytes uh, would then move on to infect the blood. So, remember the merozytes were released from the ruptured schizon and then they'll, uh, they'll go on to infect the blood. Uh, and then um, the ring stage, <coughs> and in the ring stage, uh, Trophozoids mature into schizons, which then rapture releasing merozoids as well. Um, and then uh, once some parasites differentiate into sexual erythrocytic stages, uh, which uh, can be seen here, into sexual erythrocytic stages, uh, and then some would just basically the schizons can rupture and then be released in the blood cell. And then the blood stage are uh, basically responsible for the clinical manifestation. Blood stage parasites, which I already mentioned, so also the merozytes. So the the male the the gametocytes, so the male microgametocytes and the female macrogametocytes are ingested by the anopheles mosquito during a blood meal, which is going to be here, at eight. So remember, we have the gametocytes, male and female, which will be ingested, um, and then uh, the the parasites multiplication in the mosquito is the sporogenic cycle. Um, which is C. So while in the mosquito stomach, the, the micro uh, gametes penetrate the, the macro gametes uh, generating zygotes. The zygotes turn in turn in turn become motile and elongated organites, uh, which invade the midgut of the mosquito, where they develop into oocysts, and then the oocysts rapture to release sporozoids, which make their way to the Mosquito salivary glands, and then it all starts again. So, just um, so in summary, I want you guys to remember that we have mainly three cycles when you're looking at the um, what is it when you're looking at the life cycle of the mosquito? So, we have the sporogenic cycle, which is basically occurring in the mosquito, and then in the humans, we have the exoerythrocytic cycle and the erythrocytic cycle. Um, for diagnosis, um, what you're going to be diagnosed, what you're going to see, uh, basically the immature trophozoites or the mature trophozoites, uh, or the schizons, uh, during the erythrocytic stage, or you can even see the, the gametocytes, uh, during the erythrocytic stage, which is why it's recommended to do the microscopy of the blood smear and the thick blood flow. That's why basically you're doing that. Uh, and then uh, the infective stage is basically going to be from the ruptured osseous and sporozoids, which are going to be uh, readily available accordingly. Um, anything else? Important? No. All right. So so that's it with our question for for malaria. Uh, all right. So I'll move on to to the next question, uh, which is question twenty eight. Um, Question is seeking to know what is the most likely diagnosis or is the most likely diagnosis. All right. So we have a 28 year old male who's a drug addict. 20 year old male. He has been sick for a year. When he noticed general weakness. So for a whole year, the patient has not been feeling well, has noticed general weakness, increased sweating, and weight loss. So he often had cases of respiratory diseases, several cases of respiratory diseases. 
within the last few days demonstrates intermittent fever and prophes intermittent fever and prophes might say and then there's increased general weakness and developed diarrhea with blood so on uh, examination he has polylymphadenopathy hepatic rashes in the oral cavity on abdominal palpation he has a part of spinomegaly so from the options we have hiv infections and critic stomatitis uh, chronic lymphatic leukemia colon cancer and chronic sepsis now looking at the at the symptoms that the patient has the diagnosis is going to be hiv uh, in this case uh, most likely it will be HIV AIDS, so it'll be AIDS stage. From from my analysis, it'll be AIDS stage. Why? Because the patient has a myriad of symptoms, several symptoms, including first of all general weakness, increased sweating, weight loss, and respiratory diseases. So for respiratory diseases, what you need to keep in mind is that usually we can have PCP, which is um, pneumocystis. Uh, or pneumocystic pneumonia which is commonly found in HIV patients and would commonly present when you have a CD4 count of less than 200 so this is why I'm saying that you should also remember that it might be just AIDS so instead of writing HIV infection for example I can just put it as AIDS so still it's the same um, same thing one and same thing so in addition to that so the patient also has uh, fever and profus night sweating with general weakness so night sweats and and fever and a chronic cough if it was mentioned would be indicative of um, maybe tuberculosis which can also occur in a patient um, with AIDS they can get infected with mycobacterium avium uh, which is specifically for for AIDS patient but that will be when the uh, CD4 count will be much, much, much lower. And then uh, the patient also had a, has a bloody diarrhea uh, because they are opportunistic infections uh, or opportunistic um, parasites such as cryptosporidium that can greatly uh, affect HIV AIDS patient, isospora belly as well, can also affect HIV AIDS patient. Uh, the other reason why I am choosing HIV as a diagnosis is because they already mentioned to you that this patient is a drug addict. Now, as a drug addict, we'd like to assume that the patient was uh, using some intra intravenous drugs such as heroin, meaning that they were inoculating themselves or injecting drugs, and then during the process, they might have shed needles with another infected patient and then got infected uh, and also looking at the duration of the time at which the patient has been sick uh, all of these are pointing towards AIDS so basically HIV um, is a lentivirus uh, a subgroup of retrovirus which causes HIV infection um, over time which would result in acquired immunodeficiency which was mentioning as AIDS so HIV infects uh, vital cells in the human uh, immune system including uh, helper T cells or CD4 T cells, macrophages and dendritic cells uh, and HIV leads to low levels of CD4 count uh, which is why uh, patients that are infected with HIV are more likely to be prone to opportunistic infections this is why I, I, I spoke about it earlier and, and I told you that uh, the patient might have opportunistic infections. Now, there are a lot of opportunistic infections that uh, a patient with HIV can, can suffer from. And um, uh, a very good, I'll say, a human discovery that has actually helped um, patients with HIV survive long is the, 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 the use of highly active antiretroviral therapy, which is fighting against the, the virus and helps to some extent increase uh, the CD4 count and then protect the patient. Uh, Alright, thank you very much uh, ladies and gentlemen for your attention.
um that will be it for today i hope to see you next time please don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button and please share with your friends uh thank you very much